Well, hello, everyone. This is Bishop Brian Willett coming to you live from Ackworth, Georgia, on this October 13th, 2015, for Vestiges of Christianity. Today we are talking about evil. This is part two to the edition that played on Sunday evening that originally aired back in 2012. This is a follow-up addition to that episode. And we're going to be discussing tonight exorcism ministry, its consequences, its perils. And trust me, the dangers are very real. Stay tuned. you all again for joining me on this uh, afternoon here, if you're in the Eastern Time Zone. We are uh, always working to improve this service uh, for Vestiges of Christianity using our new platform on Spreaker. There's a lot of things that are wonderful about this platform. There's quite a few things I don't like. One of those things is not being able to create a show page prior to broadcasting. Uh, so if you're ever wondering why the opening music sequence is as long as it is, it's because uh, I don't have an engineer. I do it all myself. And to be able to uh, put the link out after we go live to all of my social media takes me uh, a bit of time. Uh, so it would be, if anybody who works for Spreaker is listening to me right now, it would be awesome if you could create the ability to uh, generate show pages in advance so that we could promote our uh, podcasts um, before the fact and give people the direct link before the fact so we don't have to go through that whole process once we go live. That's a big deficit for me with Spreaker, but the sound quality uh, makes it worth it. And, you know, so we're going to stay here for the time being until something better comes along, but... Um, Anything at this point is better than our experiences with Blog Talk Radio. All right. So today, um, well, I mean, for those of you who were able to listen to the uh, classic episode that aired on Sunday, uh, I did receive some feedback from people who listened to it, and uh, people were a little bit perplexed by it. It didn't sound like my usual self. And uh, some people uh, said it uh, sounded a bit uh, almost like I was uh, losing my mind. <laughs> um, others were concerned that uh, because I was talking about uh, my life being at actual risk, and here I am almost, you know, well, three years later, still alive, uh, that some people felt that there was an explanation required for that. Uh, so I decided, uh, originally this show was going to be about the grace of God. Uh, we'll do that next time. Today we'll follow up to that episode on evil. Uh, if you have not listened to it, I highly suggest that you do, because a lot of what we're going to be talking about today uh, references material from that episode. Essentially... Uh, as an esoteric Catholic Church, which gives us the liberty to be able to plunge a bit deeper into the philosophical realities of Christianity and spirituality in general, um, has its benefits as well as its uh, deficits. And one of those deficits, most certainly, is having to philosophically reconcile certain things that at the highest absolute levels contradict what our experiences are here at the conventional level 
in which a human being finds oneself. And so the last episode it tried to, I think, did a fairly good job of explaining the two sides of that coin. How from one perspective, an absolute perspective, a cosmic perspective, things are very different than how we see things within the flesh of the human experience. And so evil is one of those things that causes the greatest deal of problems for theologians and philosophers and Christians alike. We don't understand how an omniscient, omnipotent, all-loving God could continue to allow evil things to happen. So we have all these le theological explanations to explain it. Well, some people see it as punishment for original sin. Some people see it as uh, a, a way of testing a person's viability, their fortitude, their faith. So God allows bad things to happen so that we can be properly tested to see if we are worthy of the gift of grace that he so freely gives us. But try telling that to someone who has lost a child or a loved one. Try telling that to somebody who has been suffering years of abuse at the hands of somebody else. It's not enough of an explanation. And while the theological perspectives are not exactly false, they don't do a very good job of helping people who are in crisis to understand what is going on. So from an esoteric perspective, we can take things a step further. And I again explain to you my teaching, the way I have taught evil from a mystical level, from an esoteric level, which is different than how I must discuss it when I am working with it. And there's all sorts of problems. Because any of the esoteric churches that do exist out there, those that we agree with, those that we don't agree with, are teaching to some form or fashion a negation of the sentience of evil. That there is a that there are demonic forces, demonic beings that can think and can uh, disrupt your life in all sorts of horrible ways. And then, of course, there is also the, um, the nature of Satan. Is there really a fallen angel? Do angels really exist? These are questions that, of course, the conventional church has never really had a problem with. It's been part of the conventional theology from the beginning, and it's been accepted as truth. But the esoteric churches, of course, having the freedom to go further into the philosophy, have derived at different conclusions. So take, for example, we're going to discuss a few of those before we move on. Take, for example, the liberal Catholic Church. When you read through their rites, and of course they have all the minor orders, one of which is exorcist. Exorcist is one of the minor orders that uh, Roman Catholicism has since done away with. And uh, more or less simplified, they don't really do the minor orders anymore. We do. In the Nicolaitan Catholic tradition, we still have the minor orders. But uh, the liberal Catholic Church has retained them as well. But they have revised the, in, the interpretation of the theology. So when you read through very carefully the rubrics and the theology behind their uh, ordination right to the order of exorcist, you will find that they are talking more about a psychological evil and all all about going to the extent of saying that uh, evil as it was understood in the ancient world is uh, is just incorrect because they just did not have the wisdom that we have today and that there really is no Satan out there it's just the evil within uh, our predisposition towards error which leads us uh, to make poor decisions and thus uh, sin, but not because it's being caused by some sentient evil that's out there. And then you've got other churches, like uh, the Gnostic churches, you know, the biggest Gnostic church, perhaps one of the more 
notable ones would be the Apostolic Johannite Church. And um, there's a wonderful book that was written by one of their priests, Jordan Stratford, um, called Living Gnosticism, an Ancient Way of Knowing. It's a very small book. It's something that you could read within an afternoon. Um, and uh, it, it, it does a very good job of summarizing Gnostic theology for those who uh, don't really understand what it is. Um, you know, I know Jordan Stratford. Uh, never met him, but I've had numerous conversations with him. We don't typically see eye to eye on most things. But uh, I'll give credit where credit is due. And uh, he certainly did write a fairly good book here. Um, and it does give a very good summary for those, you know, wanting to take their first plunge into Gnosticism without having to go through the, the, the complications of the Nag Hammadi. And I want to read a passage from his book because it was a, it's a point of contention here that I'm going to address here in a moment that I think is quite problematic. And then I'm going to get into a little bit of a follow-up. Hopefully we'll have time. Jordan Stratford writes in Living Gnosticism, The main obstacle is literalism and the hunger for externalization. This process is difficult, so a quicker, more simplistic understanding can be very attractive at times. We can take a Jungian approach to the idea of archons, for example, and understand them first as patterns of behavior, then as complexes, then as splinter psyches, which, as a kind of egregore and form and influence culture, as though they were third-party entities, which they're not. They're ideas, and they can't exist independent from us, even though it seems we're at their mercy. But we made them up. The only extent to which they are superpersonal is their aspect as the dark heart of the collective unconsciousness. There's a tremendous danger and assuming that the archons are real, external, malevolent entities out to control our thoughts. That's abandoning the gift of myth for paranoia. It takes a message of inheritance and responsibility and turns it into one of powerlessness and ab abdi abdication. The myths of Gnosticism are valuable when we understand them as myths, as stories which are symbolic of human processes. They serve as maps to regions explored by others before us, but to externalize and concretize is to mistake the map for the territory, which is a very common and very human failing. I have a real problem with what he wrote there. Not because he's wrong, he's actually right. But I agree with, I disagree with one thing he said. Um, and that is that by externalizing these thought processes into demons, and of course they, Gnostics use terms as archons, they're pretty much like the same thing as demons. It's not quite exactly the same, but they pretty much operate in the same form or fashion. They, you know, cause one to fall deeper into ignorance, whereas, you know, demons call one, you know, cause one to fall deeper into sin. It's pretty much the same thing, ultimately. They're evil in that sense. But for the Gnostic, for the esoteric Christian, I think sometimes it's too easy to say, oh, well, that's just a psychological process, so we don't really have to worry too much about that as long as we keep our minds in check. And unfortunately, it does not work that way. And here's where I disagree with common perceptions that are found within Gnostic churches, uh, both ancient and modern, uh, and, of course, esoteric Christian churches or esoteric Christian groups. And here's where I think everyone has missed the boat. It's not the archetypes that are thought processes. The archetypes are the ones that are the real essence of truth, whatever truth is. They are the actual condition. We are the mere reflections which is why it seems as though we are at the mercy of archetypal patterns. Even though they seem to be generated in our head, I think our head is just a receptor for some other spiritual condition that is happening at a level of reality that we are not able to perceive 
due to the limitations of human consciousness and uh, ultimately the limitations of the human brain, which, marvelous as it is, it's only able to perceive a very small aspect of the universe. So I would argue the opposite is true. The archetypes are real. We are the reflections, which is what puts us at their mercy. And so to say, to just dismiss evil or to dismiss Satan as merely something that uh, is just a psychological process that can be conquered through psychological development is not accurate. Evil is sentient. And that was the point of the previous edition uh, on evil that we did all those years ago for Vestiges of Christianity on the old platform. I faced it. And I had to make a choice. I had to make a choice between abandoning the ministry altogether, just shutting it all down, practically laicizing myself and saying that I am leaving ministry. And I have faced that decision on numerous occasions because there are times where it becomes too much for any one man to deal with. You know, when you get into exorcism ministry, and that's the ultimate. For those of you who are not aware, the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church is essentially a monastic church. It has a deep, rich, contemplative prayer life, which is its internal ministry, and its external ministry, the, the outreach ministry that it does, is exorcism ministry, or as Protestants might know it as deliverance ministry. That is to go out into... Uh, people's homes who are reporting disturbances of a paranormal nature which may be related to the demonic we can come in and help resolve those issues for them which is why the order of saint the, the sacred order of saint michael the archangel was developed by uh, the chief exorcist for the order archbishop ron file he is an old Catholic priest, uh, not in union with Rome like us. He is uh, an independent like us. They're two different churches, two different traditions, but we are united under that one order. Uh, it's also known as the Order of Exorcists. We're an international organization, and we are here to help people with paranormal disturbances, uh, but m mostly to eliminate those that are of a demonic nature. Not all of them are, but some of them do uh, turn out to be a demonic obsession, a demonic oppression, a demonic infestation, or even in some cases a demonic possession. Now one could say from the esoteric Gnostic side of Christianity, oh well that's just, you know, mental illness. It's a, it, These people have become absorbed by the archetypes that they have been playing around with through maybe an exploration of the occult or you know, that's why playing with Ouija boards and tarot cards are considered to be a risky business for the Christian because these archetypes are so powerful they can take us over. And, you know, that is all very true. But to minimize them or trivialize them down to just simple psychological processes is missing the point. They transcend psychological processes. Our psychological processes did not create them, like Jordan Stratford said in his book. They created us. We are manifestations of those eternal processes that are deeply interwoven into the fabric of the cosmos, which I would say contains the essence of all awareness. The whole cosmos is aware. And so therefore, that collective unconsciousness that he's talking about is actually this storehouse of awareness that is one of the qualities of the universe itself or of the entire cosmos, which might include multiple universes, you see. And so that's all very ethereal. It's all very speculative, it seems. It's all very philosophical and doesn't sound very Christian when you break it down. But I can assure you that at the conventional level where the Christian lives, where the Bible was written, where the word of God is held sacred, the devil is every bit as real as anything you see, if not more real. He is sentient. 
just because it's an archetype doesn't make it less sentient. In fact, it makes it more sentient. And that's a very important distinction. And I learned that lesson the hard way. You wouldn't believe the perils of exorcism ministry. As soon as you declare that you are going to help people to fight the evil that is within their lives, Satan targets you and latches onto you relentlessly. And that's what I was faced with all those years ago and are still faced with today. I've just gotten a little bit better at handling it. It gets into your head and it messes with it. I have felt depression like I have never felt before. And I am not predisposed towards depression. I have felt anxiety. I have even felt the precursor to suicidal ideation. All because of doing this work. I've conquered all of that, fortunately, though I would never want to say fully because any weakness that we might have, whether it be an emotional weakness or a physical weakness from illness, which I have many that have developed into um, stronger weaknesses and illnesses due to working this work, um, I, we can become vulnerable at any time. I have seen it with my own group. I have seen their vulnerabilities exploited by satanic forces that have tried to disrupt their lives to a point where they would maybe start to question whether or not they should be involved in this ministry so as to weaken the ministry. Because see, the only way a ministry of this kind can be strong, since everybody has weaknesses, is to have enough people working the ministry with enough variety of strength that the weaknesses can be compensated for by the other members. But that's very difficult in a small ministry like this. First of all, a lot of people don't want to get involved in this kind of ministry for the fear of demonic influences affecting their life adversely, and rightfully so. The protections that you must, that we have available to us through the grace of the church are essential, and not everybody wants to take advantage of them. They don't take it seriously until something happens. And even then, sometimes they don't take it seriously. And then you've got the problem of, you know, different, uh, different de denominations with different interpretations of grace. You know, this is a Catholic ministry. And, you know, we take the sacraments extremely seriously. In the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church, our sacraments, uh, you know, our sacramental theology is identical to that of the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. We don't mess with sacramental theology. We might have different changes to our canons, you know, like for example, we have a married priesthood. Um, we are open to the ordination of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the order of diaconess, deaconess, deaconess, sorry. Um, you know, so we will ordain women to that order, you know, some the Roman Catholic Church wouldn't do that. And that's just a canonical issue. That's not even a sacramental issue. There's historical precedence for that. You know, we got different uh, ideas in our canons. Uh, the Nicolaian tradition is very much a, a blend between Eastern and Western Christian forms. You know, it's something we can do, whereas in the Roman Catholic Church, you're not going to see that. <clears throat> but we, as far as our sacramental theology, it is identical in interpretation to that of the Roman Church. And that's for a very specific reason, because that is not something that can be changed, not for anyone's benefit, which is what we were talking about a few weeks ago when we were talking about gay marriage. The sacramental theology is immutable, cannot be changed for convenience sake. And so we have these protections, but a lot of people that come into our ministry are not of the uh, Catholic persuasion, and uh, they think that they're, you know, whatever church they belong to is enough to protect them, and I hope that it is. But when you don't have the sacramentals of the church, when you're not using holy water and, uh, you know, blessed objects, when you don't have uh, the, 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 the grace and support of, of uh, the communion of saints and the sacraments of the church, you are vulnerable. And, you know, some people don't even understand the, the, the value of of, of the sacraments or how important they are. They see them as symbols and they're not symbols. 
They are living expressions of grace. It's your way of being able to connect with God physically, tangibly. And that cannot be underestimated. So, three years later, I'm still here. I haven't died, thank God. And that's by the grace of God that I can say that. But the battle continues. I can't get into all the details of what happened all those years ago because I would be betraying many confidences. Uh, there are many people involved. And I don't want to discuss it for respect out of them. However, that being said, there is true danger to this work. Evil is real. And I cannot, uh, I cannot, em- over, I cannot overemphasize enough How important it is that we need your support. I have reopened vocations to priesthood for the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church. You can see it at Nicolaian.org. And um, if you live in the Atlanta, Georgia area and would like to be involved in this ministry and are seeking or feel a vocation or call to priesthood, I want to hear from you. Please apply. Go to our website at Nicolaian.org and apply. Because we need more ministers. If you don't feel a vocation to priesthood, if you don't feel like this is a ministry that you can work as a layperson, then please support us by giving us a donation because we need your help to be able to reach as many people as we can. There are constant cases coming in and not enough people, not enough people to help them. And that's a very unfortunate reality that we just don't have uh, the resources to do as much as we need to. The ministry needs your help, one way or the other, through manpower or through the commitment of regular donations to help support the work that we do. Evil is real. Satan is real. He is sentient. And he is out to destroy everything that is good. We are here to stop that from happening. We are here to liberate people through the grace of God, through the grace of his church, so that people can live lives of abundance in the glory of God. Help us to do that. Thank you all, and next time we will be talking about grace, which is quite a nice transition from this subject. Take care, everyone. I'll see you then.